I'm not sure why he has to also say that he was a founder when he wasn't there, whatever. Elon Musk is one of the co-founders of Tesla. It says so in this core document. But many of you will disagree. Most of you will probably disagree by the time we finish this story. So this will be a video about judging. And by all means, please do your judging in the comments. I'm going to do my best to stick to facts. I spent days digging through the court documents, the lawsuits, and the history of Tesla to figure out how Elon Musk orchestrated one of the most hostile startup takeovers in recent history and how he somehow managed to make everyone forget about it. For us founders, this is a cautionary tale of how our investors might overpower us and how in the end, money wins. So let's go back to the winter of 2003. Martin Everhart and Mark Tarpening have been toying with the idea of starting an electric car company for a while, and they've been meeting with various people. On a trip to Disneyland with his wife in January, Mark coins the name Tesla, and he bought the domain, and then by July 1st, they've incorporated the company. Martin is gonna serve as CEO, while Mark is gonna serve as CFO, but who's the CTO? Don't you need one if you're starting a tech company? I was pretty convinced, you know, working with Martin and we were looking through the numbers and that it was gonna be possible to make the thing that made the car go. But I was very concerned we weren't gonna be able to make the car to go around it. Martin Everhart was an engineer, both a computer scientist and an electrical engineer. He began his career at Wise, a computer company that eventually became a part of Dell. And he eventually left Wise to start a company with his friend, Mark Tarpening. Mark had been working at Textron in Saudi Arabia and bonded with Martin by playing Magic the Gathering. The company was called Nuva Media and they developed this thing. This was one of the first e-readers in the world, released in 1998. For context, this is nine years before the Kindle and 12 years before the iPad. It sold for $499, which is about $950 today. It weighed over one pound and it could hold, wait for it, 10 books. They actually tried to get Jeff Bezos and Amazon to invest in this thing, but they couldn't really strike a deal. Jeff who? <laughs> and instead, they went with a $4 million round of funding that was led by Bertelsmann and Barnes & Noble. They sold, they sold 20,000 units the year after. And even if this business wasn't really working out, mostly because nobody had actually digitized their books at the time, they ended up selling the company for $187 million. So after this little adventure, Martin and Mark were good friends, they were partners, and they were loaded. Something else was happening in the 90s, besides grunge and Super Nintendos and my coming of age, California released this law, the ZEV or the Zero Emission Vehicle Rule, which mandated that major car manufacturers had to offer a zero emissions vehicle by the end of the decade. So check this out. This is the 1990 version of the Zero Emission Vehicle Program. It said that by 2003, 10% of new vehicles produced had to be electric. Today, 2024, not even 1% of the US fleet is electric. We're far behind the rest of the world. I actually collaborated on a video with The Hustle precisely on why the US is lagging so far behind on this adoption. I'm gonna link it below. But they did. Car companies started manufacturing actual electric cars in the 90s. GM spent about $1 billion developing the GM EV1, which went into production. It had an 18 kilowatt lead acid battery with a range of about 70 miles. Just at the time when I thought I might go buy an electric car, maybe an EV1 or something, they were no longer available. They were actually being taken off the market. And in fact, if, if it was an EV1, they were actually taken back from the owners and destroyed. So the mandate was gutted in the early 2000s when everybody realized that this 10% adoption goal was just impossible. The, the mandate still exists. It just became less strict. And this is in part what sparked the idea for Tesla. There was a small company in Southern California called AC Propulsion, very homemade. The majority of their income had come from doing small projects for the car companies as they were trying to make electric car demonstrations. But but now that the electric car, the, the, the zero emissions vehicle mandate had been gutted, so I reached out and, and actually rescued them. I invested some of my own money into the company and, and tried to get them to build me personally a car. These guys had the money, but they didn't have the expertise. They had some hardware experience, sure, but no car manufacturing experience. I basically financed them to convert their car to a kind of a crude lithium-ion battery pack. That's where it began. They spent the months leading up to that incorporation date talking to potential partners, and their whole idea was to focus on the tech inside the vehicle and get an external company to partner with them and build the actual car part. Lotus was able to write a letter for us that said, if this company can do what it says and gets funded and everything else, we might be their partner, yeah. might. They were finally incorporated in July, and soon after they hired this dude, Ian Wright, as their first employee and also without a background in car manufacturing. They're both neighbors of mine. I bumped into to my party and he said, hey, I know you used to build in race cars. A friend and I were thinking about building you know, high performance electric sports cars. What do you think? And I said, I think you're crazy. They're golf carts, aren't they? Ian's literal LinkedIn notes about his tenure in Tesla says, 
I pitched Tesla to Elon and he became the first investor. That was a great call for both parties. Now here's some intrigue for you. That LinkedIn bio says Tesla co-founder. He was employee three. He flew with Martin to pitch Elon at the very, very early SpaceX headquarters. Well, he most definitely wasn't there when they incorporated the company and yet he gets to call himself a co-founder and no lawsuit for him? Hold that thought. One of the great things about pitching to Elon in this context is that a lot of times we would pitch to the VCs and, and to other you know angels. They would say, what you're trying to do is so crazy. You know, you're trying to make an electric sports car. That's insane. We are pitching to somebody who is actually trying to make rocket ships. So Elon was in. He invested in Tesla's first round of funding, a $7.5 million Series A, of which Elon contributed $6.35 million. And now before we go on, let me explain this ordeal with rounds of funding. Explainer. Time. All businesses need money to get started. Most businesses use money from the founders and they start selling and then they use their own revenue and their own profits to continue growing. But some companies need a shit ton of money to even exist. They may need to develop a product or software or a spaceship before they can get customers. And sometimes all that R&D money goes to waste and they end up as company forensic story so then we can make videos for YouTube. But when it works, you get the Teslas and the Metas and the Amazons of the world. Tesla made about $15 billion in profit in 2023. And that's only bound to grow, but in order to get there, it had to burn through $11 billion worth of investments. And even if you're Elon Musk, nobody's gonna give you $19 billion upfront just to build your company. So funding is raised in rounds. Nowadays, a pre-seed round is what comes first, and it's raised by a solid group of founders with with talent, with a good idea, and with some initial traits of a prototype. It's usually in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, if the founders have money, they can bring that capital themselves. If you're in this path of raising alphabet rounds of funding for your startup, maybe we can help. I, I love telling these stories on YouTube, but that's not really what pays my salary. We, Slidebean, we're a venture back startup. We're a 500 company. We raised our own pre-seed and seed rounds, and we've been helping companies for over 10 years navigate this fundraising mess. We've helped thousands of pre-seed companies write the deck that got them their first funding, all the way up to series B companies like Upkeep who worked with our team for weeks to craft a pitch deck that raised them $36 million. But for most founders, the way we can help you is with a subscription that we've created that gives you monthly pitch deck reviews with our team, fundraising, strategy calls, access to every tool and template that we've ever built, including our investor finder and our AI pitch deck builder. And all Accelerate subscriptions also start with a kickoff call with me. And it's just 99 a month. I'll link it below. We self-funded it first. Some of my money, some of my brothers and friends and stuff like that, little bits of money here and there. And we were also touching the VC community, particularly ones that had made money on our previous investment. Right. The seed round comes after the pre-seed round. But back in that day, the VC capital naming convention didn't exist. So these guys probably considered their early money a seed round or a founder's round. And that meant that the first venture capital round would be their series A. Contrary to what people think, in each round of funding, new shares of stock are issued to the new investors. It's not that a percentage is sold, it's not that you're transferring shares to an investor, but rather the company creates new shares every time. We have a whole video about this. Now we know from Tesla's S1 filings, which is the stuff that you have to file when the company's about to go public, that about 15 million shares were issued to Tesla's Series A investors at a price per share of about 49 cents. Now these shares probably represented something like 30% of the total shares that the company had. So if 30% of the company was worth $7.5 million, that means that the business was valued valued at about $25 million, which would make no sense in traditional businesses because they are just a few guys with an idea. But these companies have such a massive potential in the future that investors are normally willing to pour millions of dollars in exchange for seemingly small percentages of the company. And that was the case for Elon. At the time, Elon had made about $22 million from selling his company to Compaq and many, many more millions of dollars from the $1.5 billion deal of selling X slash PayPal to eBay. Now we know that he invested $100 million of his own cash into SpaceX. So this six million and some check to Tesla, that was a bit of a side gig for him. Now, if you're putting money into a company, you would want some level of control or say in the company's decisions. And that's what the board is for. So the board of directors is a group of people authorized to speak and to decide on behalf of the shareholders. Since companies can end up having hundreds, thousands of shareholders if they go public, it makes no sense having to ask everyone to vote for every single company decision. So the board has pretty much the entire power to make key business decisions for the company. Now, at the time of Tesla going public, Tesla's board consisted of 11 people. Three members were elected by their Series A and Series B investors. 
one member was elected by their Series C investors, two members by their Series D investors, one member by their Series F investors, and all the common shares voting together elected the rest of the members. But when Tesla was in Series A stage, right after Elon writing his check, this would have been a much smaller group. And both founders were probably there as part of the board as well, as well as some other investors and sometimes other independent experts. But Elon conditioned his Series A investment against being chairman of the board. This is aggressive, but it's not unconventional considering how much cash he was putting in. The chairman of the board is very different from the CEO. Their job is to oversee board meetings and the long-term vision of the company. For example, Apple's chairman of the board is this guy, and the CEO is, of course, Tim Apple. The CEO is in charge of day-to-day -day operations. They report to the board, so if a certain majority of the board members agree, they can actually fire the CEO, which is going to be important in just a second. The board is unanimous. Steve will no longer be involved in this company. Tesla then got things moving in developing the Roadster with Elon as chairman and Martin as CEO. Elon provided ideas and oversight, but day-to-day -day operations were still under Everhart. We need to change the way the world thinks about electric cars, okay? Today, people think about electric cars as little ugly things that nobody wants to drive. To change the way people think about that, we need to make something as radically different than what, uh, than what people expect. By February 2005, they needed more money, so they raised another $13 million, which we estimate was at a valuation of about $51 million. At this point, Series A and Series B investors probably owned about 48% of the company. I actually ran this math in our cap table tool. I'm gonna link it below if you wanna download it. But the point is, the rules of the board, if they're similar to what we've described before, meant that Series A and Series B investors essentially controlled about half the votes on the board. A Series C round of funding came in May 2006. At a valuation, we estimate, of around $117 million. Martin and Mark, I mean, they had money, but they weren't millionaires, so they obviously didn't participate in these huge $100 million rounds of funding. Now, assuming their initial stake was about 15 million shares each, the company had likely issued about 68 million new shares by then. That means their stake in Tesla was worth about $40 million on paper, which is great, but they no longer had a controlling majority. Which, I mean, they didn't really have a choice. How else are you gonna get $60 million worth of funding injected into your business idea? Soon after this funding round, Under Martin, still a CEO, the Roadster was revealed. You can have a car that's quick and you can have a car that's electric, but having one that's both is how you make electric cars popular. The car was $100,000, but the media and the press stunt worked, and they sold 127 cars thanks to that event. You know, I stood up and gave a talk about what the car was doing. And there had been a rumor that Governor Schwarzenegger, who's governor at the time, might might show up, but you know, like, who knows, right? But Elon, Elon didn't enjoy the launch at all. The way that my role has been portrayed to date, where I am referred to Amelia as an early investor, is outrageous. That would be like Martin being called an early employee. This is an email from Elon Musk to Martin and to Harrigan, their VP of customer service. I was incredibly insulted and embarrassed by the New York Times article, where I am not merely unmentioned, but where Martin is actually referred to as the chairman. If anything like this happens again, please consider the PCGC relationship with Tesla to end immediately upon publication of such a piece. The first time we really bumped heads was over that press coverage of the debut. We had technical disagreements that we worked through, and it was always very collegial. We would work through our opinions and come to a conclusion. That was the first time where it was this emotional. The days and months that followed were chaos. There were massive production issues with the Roadster, not to mention the challenges of dealing with 140 employees by now. Elon and Martin sat down for dinner in January of 2007, and Martin suggested bringing a new CEO into the company. And the record is very straight here. This was Martin's idea. They brought it to the board, and the idea was pretty well received. It was a completely friendly discussion with a couple of speeches from board members about how it was very much the normal course of a startup. They started looking for a new CEO, but it's, of course, hard to find someone with enough tech and automotive experience that was both approved by Elon as chairman, as Martin, as, as a vote in the board. And then while Lotus was still gonna manufacture the car, Tesla needed to supply more and more components of the production chain, and they were still struggling to make it happen, months behind schedule. We originally planned to use a lot more standard technologies, for example, ordinary door handles, rather than electric door handles. As we changed to more and more exotic ideas along the way, we, we took on more and more risk of that. I think Elon was part of the cost too. He was still just the chairman of the board, but a very involved one. So he would go and be
be the CEO of SpaceX, which he was, and he would disconnect himself from Tesla for a few days or a few weeks. And then by the time he caught up on what everybody was doing and the new progress that Tesla had made, he would scratch a lot of plans and have them backtrack. And this wasn't the only problem, of course, but many employees report and remember many delays caused by this situation. And soon enough, the news started leaking that Tesla was looking for a new CEO. But on a surprise phone call in August, Elon called Martin to tell him that he was being removed. This was actually an illegal move. The board of directors had met without him, which was a board member, and they had decided to oust him. The Tesla board had to meet the next day again to be able to officially fire Martin. But the decision was already made. He didn't have the votes and he was out. When I got kicked out of Tesla, I had no money. I mean, I really had no money. Worse than that, I had no possibility of employment for about a year because of a restrictive intellectual property agreement with Tesla. I, I was voted off the island and in a, in a rather rude way. It wound up with uh, some lawsuits and some settlements. A lot of people would think that Elon took over at this point, but that's not the case. The company actually had two CEOs before that happened. The first one was Michael Marx, who was the former CEO of the manufacturer Flextronics. And he had invested $2.5 million of his own money into the company. And he came to put out fires and a bunch of messes, first replacing the CEO and then production issues. And then he was replaced by Zev Drory, the former CEO of a car alarm maker called Clifford Electronics. Elon only really took over Tesla over a year after Martin had left. And so we've arrived to the lawsuit. Eberhardt, the plaintiff, is suing Elon Musk for 11 complaints. Libel, slander, injunctive relief, breach of contract, specific performance contract, declaratory relief, failure to pay due and wages, penalty for failure to pay wages, failure to write, lawful wage statements, conversion, and negligence, including negligent infliction of emotional distress. Musk engineered the ouster of Eberhard from all roles at Tesla Motors in November 2007. He next endeavored to take ownership of the idea behind Tesla Motors by denigrating Eberhard's contributions. It says that Elon Musk began defaming Eberhard across media outlets which, I mean, it was true. But what Martin absolutely could not put up with was other people calling themselves Tesla's co-founders. I'm not sure why he has to also say that he was a founder when he wasn't, I don't understand. Oh, well, yeah, whatever. What that early crew put up with in the early days. When JB likes to call himself a founder, it's, it's, uh, it's funny because um, Tristan started the same day. <laughs> That's right. So yeah. if he's a founder, so she. Yeah. Right? right? So the, the lawsuit is full of these little Fun, fun little mementos about Tesla. So this is a certificate of Martin to himself, awarding himself the second Tesla roaster ever created. Like literally, by Martin, signed by Martin. His actual resignation letter, which he had to sign and the new CEO had to acknowledge. And overall, just a bunch of really old school prints of very early 2000s internet. Now, a good chunk of the lawsuit is about a severance agreement that would have vested all of Martin's shares and give him a six month severance and, and health insurance and everything after he resigned. And the lawsuit claims that this was not paid. And then ultimately, Martin demands a trial by combat. Fight! No, just trial by jury. It's, it's his history now. Yeah, so I can't say a lot about it. So the lawsuit settled out of court. We would assume that Martin got his wages paid, but We'll just never know. What we know is that they agree that Elon, as well as three other early employees slash co-founders, could actually call themselves co-founders. But the question was for you, the, the question at the beginning, who gets to call themselves a co-founder of a company? Is it the people who incorporate? Is it the people who fund the company? What if they help build it too? What if they were the first employee? Now is the time for judging, and you want to drop that in the comments. I promised you all the facts, and I've given you the facts. I'm going to save my opinions for our own video about Elon. See you guys next week.